Side Hustle Show 172, creating an online authority business and service business from scratch. Can lightning strike twice? Welcome to the Side Hustle Show, where aspiring part-time entrepreneurs learn how to turn their side hustle dreams into reality. Because your nine to five may make you a living, but your five to nine makes you alive. And now your host, Nick Loper. What's up, what's up? Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show. It's all about ideas, action, and results. My guest today spent 20 years of his professional career as a pastor before taking action on some online side hustle ideas. Eventually, he found one that was a hit, helping others pass a certification exam on the industry he was transitioning into. That business now earns 1000 bucks a week, and we're about to dive into his content creation, marketing, and pricing strategies for that. Now, I'm talking about Kerry Green and PassTheSafeExam.com. PassTheSafeExam.com. But Kerry didn't stop there. He's also built a service business from scratch that now has eight team members, and that's in the uh, podcast editing and show notes space. And actually, it's uh, his company has taken over doing the editing for the Side Hustle Show for the past couple months. So if you like the editing that's been done, um, definitely you know let him know. Let me know. He breaks down how he came up with that idea, how he sets up clients on a recurring subscription model, and how he hustled hard to land his first paying customers. All the notes and links for this one, plus a free downloadable PDF with Carrie's top tips, are at Side Hustle Nation dot com slash carry c-a-r-e-y i want to thank freshbooks.com for sponsoring this edition of the side hustle show freshbooks is the affordable small business accounting software built specifically for side hustlers and freelancers you can get started with your 30-day free trial at freshbooks.com slash side hustle i'm going to be back to tell you a little bit more about freshbooks along with my top takeaways from this chat with carrie after the interview ready uh, let's do it I started out while I was still in my former career as a pastor. I was doing some listening to podcasts, some of the big names that you hear all the time come to mind, you know, Pat Flynn and others like that, just listening to other people's stories. And that convinced me that it was possible, but it didn't necessarily convince me that I could do it until I started trying. And so the first things I put together were some AdSense based niche sites. Back at that time, I think Pat was talking with Spencer Hawes a lot and, and other people about niche sites. And so I gave that a try. And I still have that particular, the first niche site I still have. And it brings in a little bit of income every month, but not nearly what I needed because I was kind of in a transition phase. I needed more income. So I moved on to other things. I created an online video course that, that actually is doing very well now. It took a while for it to get rolling. And then I tried some other things that didn't work. And, you know, to me, it was just kind of a learn as you go thing. And in that first cha-ching of 25 bucks or so that I made from that video course was what convinced me that I could do this. More so than the pennies from AdSense clicks. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, when I, when I made 25 bucks on one course, I realized, you know, this is viable. I can make this happen. And so I just ramped up the marketing and I ramped up efforts at other things. And, and in time, Podcast Fast Track came from that as well, which is its own story. So real quick, tell me about the, so this is a video course for mortgage brokers. Well, it's a video course for people studying to become a mortgage broker. Okay. There's a nationally mandated test called the NMLS test, and some people call it the SAFE exam. And it is one of the hardest tests I've ever taken in my life. And as I was studying for the test, to become a mortgage loan broker as I was transitioning out of my pastoral career, I realized uh, the whole process was a mess and convoluted and it, it wasn't an easy test to study for. So I started building this video course as I was studying. So if you can imagine that, I haven't even passed the test yet and I'm building this course because I had Pat Flynn in the back of my mind telling me, you know, this course would be a good idea. So, you know, I started building the course and, and I knew it all hinged on me passing the test. So I passed the test the first time and got that course online probably within two or three weeks after that. Because you were creating the content as you were studying. I was because it was simple just to do a screencast of the stuff I was doing and put it into a video format. And then I created PDF downloads to go along with it and all this other stuff and put it online and started promoting it mainly through YouTube and LinkedIn. No paid promotions, just putting videos on YouTube and announcements on LinkedIn here and there and started getting a little bit of traffic. And over the years, it's, it's grown. It's been online for almost three years now. And it brings in a significant portion of income every month for my family. So it's, it's been a great thing. And at this point, it's almost entirely passive, which I love. That's great. That's a passive income dream. Yeah, it really is. I, I want to dive into the podcast stuff, but this is like actually really juicy. So this was not a huge content creation burden for you, like building a niche site. 
so the, the URL is past the safe exam.com. So it's primarily creating the video content and then creating these other kind of study materials. And, and the majority of that stuff is paid. So how are people discovering the site? Like you mentioned YouTube, you mentioned LinkedIn, but you want to dive in a little more into the strategy behind those marketing channels? Sure. At the beginning on LinkedIn, I found mortgage and, and mortgage broker based groups and got in those groups and just started making some connections. And when people would ask questions about this particular test, I would pipe up and say, you know, I've built a study methods course and it's a pay what you want thing starting at $25 and, you know, check it out if you want and started getting a few sales that way. But over time, that particular lead source started drying up a little more and YouTube started taking off. And on YouTube, I was just putting helpful videos on there talking about the test, about the study process, about the changes that are happening in the industry. Sometimes the videos weren't even related directly to taking the test. But as YouTube allows you to do, I had the annotation links in there to my site. And now YouTube is far and away my biggest source of revenue for that course. So it does a pretty good business, you know, at least a thousand bucks a week that's coming in. Wow. And we're loving it. You know, it's an amazing thing. We shake our heads every time, you know, the little cha-ching happens on my email because <laughs> we, we just can't believe it, it's really happening. Do you find people are generally paying the 25 bucks or like just on the pricing structure? Do you have people like, oh, this is awesome. I'm going to give you $500. You know, I've never had anybody give me $500. <laughs> Let me just say this. The majority of people do 25 bucks. There's people that do 30 quite often. There's some that'll do 50. I think the course is probably worth around 125, 130 bucks. Yeah. And I had one lady after she passed the test ask for my mailing address. And and so I thought, heck, why not? She is a student. I'll give it to her. And she sent me a check for a hundred bucks Oh wow! and a thank you note. And so it was just really sweet. And that's happened a few times, though not much. It's essentially 25 bucks at a time making a thousand bucks a week. It's pretty that's incredible. a lot of customers. It is. And I've got some additional materials that they can buy for higher price points, but those are much less purchased than the $25 course. How did you decide what content to put for free on YouTube versus what to put behind the paywall? That is a hard decision. The paywall basically is the entire thing. And I'll take snippets of some of those videos and show, for example, I've got a video on the math portion of the test. And I'll show like the first of six different procedures that are in the math video. And then fade the video out and say five more math lessons inside the course or things like that. So I just show pieces usually if it's from the course. And then I have some videos that aren't part of the course at all. They're just me talking into the camera about my experience and the frustrations I felt, you know, kind of building up that sense of need. And so I created this course and I don't want to gouge you on the price. So it's a $25 pay what you want. And then at least it seems people are going to check it out. When I look at my stats, where people are coming from, it is far and away YouTube. Yeah. I know it's being effective. And it parallels a lot of things. Like if there is a national certification, a state certification for whatever industry you're in, like there is uh, probably a market to help people pass that test, especially if that's a business relationship where, you know, they are going to see uh, hopefully an increase in income once they pass this test. So they may be willing to invest some money uh, for help in doing that. The other thing that you mentioned is interesting is that the content that you've created is not necessarily like the content of the test itself, but more like how to study for it. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. I discovered as I was studying for it, the test has a lot of confusing questions and what some people might call trick questions. And it's hard to determine sometimes how the question's phrased and where the trick is and that kind of stuff. And in my mind, they're not really trick questions. They're things that you're going to face as a mortgage broker and you need to be able to know how to figure it out. And so my mind just kind of works that way. I'm able to see things and sort things out and figure out uh, where, where the little hitch is in the question. And so I just thought, you know, there's a lot of people that don't think on this level or, or know how to look at it. And so I'm, I'm just going to teach them. In some of my videos, I'm just going through questions that were on my test and I'm showing, okay, see this little phrase right here? That's where they're trying to trip you up because that really has nothing to do with the rest of the question, you know, okay. and things like that. So it's giving people tips on how to read questions, how to understand them. There's even a, a module I'm creating right now to add to the course about managing the stress of taking the test and, and breathing exercises and things like that. So it's more about getting yourself ready to take the test with some confidence than it is the content itself, because the content changes all the time. Regulations change. This way it makes it a little more evergreen. Yeah, exactly. And the regulations change and, and that's just not my forte. So especially now that I'm not a mortgage broker anymore. Now I just help people become mortgage brokers. Yeah, yeah. You're the second person in the past couple of months to mention YouTube as a really important marketing channel just because it's so much quicker to rank videos 
keyword titled videos and be smart about your YouTube SEO and then using those annotation links, which I had heard of but never really uh, tried to implement. So I've got probably some homework to go through some of the videos I've created adding those links. I only ever have just linked in uh, the description versus like in the video itself. I think that's a really smart way to go about it. Plus you're building a relationship with the people who found you. And there's a few little hoops you have to jump through in order to get those annotations set up in the administrative settings of, of your YouTube channel. And I don't remember exactly what they're called right off the top of my head, but but you can find them and you have to set up the ability to do that and link to a, a website and those kind of things. And then any URL you set up with that website, you're allowed to connect to that YouTube channel. And so using a pretty link or something like that, you can even go to a totally different website as long as it goes through yours. Okay, so you have to get your domain approved first and then yeah. you can link to them. And that's that, that the pretty link is an interesting workaround there. Yeah, it's easy because I host my course on Gumroad as far as the payment process goes. So some some of my links go directly to Gumroad, but they go through a pretty link on my website. Okay, well then you can track how many people click them too. Exactly. Hey, just wanted to jump in here. If you have no idea what we're talking about, Pretty Link is a free WordPress plugin that allows you to make your URLs pretty or memorable. So for example, the the short URL for this episode, sidehustlenation.com slash carry, that's a pretty link. Um, sidehustlenation.com slash lead pages is my affiliate link for lead pages. It's a way to uh, kind of redirect people to where you want to go, either on your site or another site. So I think that was a really cool workaround um, for YouTube's annotation rules that Carrie just shared a huge opportunity. Maybe there's a parallel for you in your industry to help people pass whatever certification exam is out there. But I want to dive into the service business. And where did you come up with the idea for the podcast editing service or podcast fast track service? Sure. Uh, I was working with a friend who I had met online on some audio he had that he wanted to make a podcast out of. And he knew how to use Audacity, but which is an audio editing program but didn't know how to use it really well. And so he was asking my advice. I don't know how we had a conversation where he knew I knew how to use it, but I had been doing Audacity for a long time. And in fact, my niche site had to do with using Audacity. So two things came together there. And as I was helping him online on video chat one day, he said, you should make a business out of this. And I had been podcasting for about a year and a half at that time. And I recognized the minute he said it, he's exactly right. This is a big pain point for podcasters in terms of the time suck that it is to do good editing and to write show notes and all those kinds of things. So I kind of thought it through and put together a pricing model, which in retrospect, I hated and changed after about three or four months. Why did you hate it? What was wrong with it? Well, I was doing it on a kind of like an a la carte basis where I would charge someone per episode. And that was too time intensive. I had to send in voices. I had to done people for payments. I had to do stuff like that. And so what I did is I switched it to a monthly subscription model so that it goes through PayPal and automatically debits their credit card. And so I don't have to chase down the money at all. The payment comes in like clockwork and we just set up what that subscription is going to include on each client's individual basis. And so the payment side is much simpler. And so this friend had inspired me and I started putting together that pricing model and what I was going to include. And I just started marketing with cold emails to people I found on iTunes that I thought might use my service. And within probably a week and a half, maybe two weeks, I had my first full-time client. And then that friend that suggested I start doing it for a business actually became one of my clients within about six months. Here's a good example of a business where, you know, my client base is is pretty well defined and they're easy to find, right? Like there's a public directory and you can see, you know, which of the shows are presumably earning money. Like if you listen to an episode and they have a sponsor, you could say, well, hey, this guy might have budget to spend on this type of service. Yeah, exactly. And iTunes for my particular business made it really easy because I can go there and find almost everybody on the planet who podcasts. And if I'm willing to take the time to go through the iTunes directory, pick out the shows that look like their potential clients and just reach out to them, not with a cold marketing email, but just with a friendly introducing myself, I love your show, show that I've taken some time to look into their show and what it's like, then I tend to generate conversations where people are open to hearing about my pricing. And over time, I've learned that what I'm really selling is time. I'm not selling great audio and I'm not selling great show notes, even though we do provide those. I'm selling time. And when I approach it that way, most of the conversations lead in a, in a really productive direction. Yeah, it's kind of what I see as part of a larger trend, like the rise of you know, hyper-specialized virtual assistant services or outsourcing services instead of like a generalist call center operation. It's like, you know, this is the one thing that we do. We do it really well. 
That's exactly it. And we're adding more services to our company all the time. But and when I say we, it's it's my team and I. Mm-hmm. But it's all podcast focused. Okay. We'll get into the team in a second. I was just curious, was there any did you start out targeting only business podcasts or only like, you know, personal development shows or something like that? At first it was anything in the business category. And there's actually an online version of the iTunes directory where you can break it down into categories like business or, or arts or whatever. And so I would go into, into the business and then there's like five or six subcategories under that. So I would just take my time and go alphabetically through the first subcategory until I've contacted everybody in that section that I think would be a good client. And then I move on to the B's and then I move on to the C's. And, and I do this all myself. I don't outsource to someone else because I want the approach to be personal and I want it to be friendly and I want it to be genuine. And so that approach seems to be very much uh, more effective than if I just hired a marketing service to do this for me. Yeah, the personal outreach can be huge and, and easy to find in this case. What was that initial pitch email or wasn't necessarily even a pitch? Yeah, well, I essentially still use the very same email. So let me pull it up here and I can just read it to you. It's pretty simple. I've discovered that, well, some of the marketing things that I've learned over the years are that I need to keep it short. I need to keep it sweet. I need to be very clear about what I do and what I don't do. And so, for example, I'll I'll, uh, read it as if I'm reading it to you, Nick. It says, hey, Nick, you've got a great sounding show. And I'll usually mention the name of the show because I do listen to an episode or two before I contact the person. And then I say, I am impressed. I'm writing to see if I can be of help to you. My name's Kerry Green. My business specializes in two simple things. Number one, I save you time by handling the technical parts of your podcast, like editing effects, metadata, etc. Number two, I create keyword rich show notes. My team does a great job representing your episode in a powerful SEO rich way. And then I just say, I've got systems in place to make the process painless and smooth uh, so that my clients know their show's done on time, every time and professionally. And I'd love to make, make a connection with you if you're interested. And then I leave my contact info and sign off. It's just really simple. And what kind of response rate do you see from those? I keep stats on that. I know that my click-through rate, meaning someone who responds in some way to the email, either saying yes, no, or maybe later, I consider that a click-through because they've responded in some way. That click-through rate is pushing 15%. And then my actual conversion rate from those click-throughs is closer to about three and a half to four. Okay. So I'm three to 4% of the time, I'm making a client out of that person. And remember, it's an ongoing monthly client. A little bit of a numbers game there, but hey, there's plenty of shows out there. Oh, yeah. And that's really what I've learned about marketing is it's, it's in the numbers. If you approach it right and you just keep doing it consistently, you will build a client base. So I could be that person who sends 97 emails and gets 97 no's or 97, you know, maybe later's. And, you know, those next three were going to be my 3% that convert. Like, what kept you going? Like, well, how did you feel like, yeah, I've got something here? First, I kept tweaking my email. I, I made it shorter. I made it more friendly. I made it more obvious that I had looked at the person's things. I, I just kept trying to do things to show them I care about you. So that's the first thing I did. Second thing I did was I started keeping track. I sent out this many emails today. And then as I got responses, I would put together a spreadsheet that calculated my response rate. And I started seeing that for about every 10 emails I sent out, I got one or two that responded. And those percentages change from time to time. But it started encouraging me, okay, if I send out this many emails, I will get responses. And I just encouraged myself that way. Just knowing that once I start that conversation, if I can get the person on the phone or get them on video, the conversion rate goes up a lot faster because that face-to-face interaction enables them to feel like they can trust you more. I mean, that's what kept me going is just looking at the numbers and saying, I know it's going to happen. I just have to keep at it. So that's the next step in your process, kind of getting somebody on the phone and saying what exactly they need help with? Yeah. I mean, if they respond to the email, they usually will say, what's your pricing? Or, you know, what can you do for me? What are you offering me? And, and so then we start a conversation where I'm asking them four simple questions. You know, how many episodes are you doing a month? How long is your average episode? What degree of editing do you want? And would you like show notes quote with that? I make that email very simple so that they can fill it out really quickly. And then I send them a quote based on their show. So it's not a per hour editing rate. It's a four year show every month. This is what it would cost. Okay. And if they're still interested then, then we jump on the phone or, or Skype or whatever. And it's amazing to me the number of clients I've actually closed via email. You know, they say, how do I get started? <laughs> and I send them a PayPal link and they click on it and pay me and off we go. What do you see as as maybe another growth opportunity for this? Or is there like, you know, wh- when did you hit your 
personal ceiling of capacity on this. Yeah, that really was the thing that determined when I needed to start adding a team was my personal capacity. There was a point where I was editing probably 10 to 12 episodes a day and writing show notes for five to six all in one day. Those were really long days. I started first hiring my oldest son, who's 25, to help me. And he he just loves doing audio editing, which I was real thankful for. And so I got him started and I started taking over all the writing and he's taking over the editing. And in time, I've had to add more editors and more writers. And it really has become a thing where I see that the, the more skilled people I can get on board, the more I can replicate what I've been doing. And so I mean, you're right on, Nick. It was personal capacity that pushed me to the point. And I drug my heels on that a little bit, to be honest. You know, when you pay someone to take on some of this, you're giving away some of your profits. So you, you want to be slow about that. At the same time, I couldn't keep up that pace. And so I was forced to either scale back and do what only I can do and keep the business small. Or if I want to grow it larger for the sake of income, which I did, then I'm going to have to bring on a team. At some point, it comes down to that decision. Did you raise your prices at that point to kind of have enough margin to pay somebody else to do the work? Or did you have that margin built in? I had a little bit of margin built in. But when I realized I was going to have to start adding team members, I did raise my prices a little bit. And to be real honest with you, my prices are pretty fluid because every podcaster wants something different. Yeah. So some want on a, on a one to 10 scale, some want a nine level of editing and some want a zero. So the price reflects that. So depending on what the client wants and how much extra time it's going to be, then I adjust the pricing. And I think that's fair because, you know, it is a time issue for my contractors. I want to pay them well. So I make the pricing such that I can. Yeah, it's a productized service, but maybe not in the fully traditional sense where it's like, oh, yeah, you know, it's still there's an element of custom uh, customization or custom quote. Yeah, I don't have a one size fits all if that if that helps. I don't have one size fits all pricing. Every client is unique. And so I have averages. Definitely. But I, I want to talk to every client about their specific show before I give them a price. How do you go about like because podcast editing is such a subjective art form and and for a lot of times like this is really important to the host's business where it, it could be tough to have them let go, like work with that being such a subjective deliverable. That's a great question. I first start out by having the client give me what I call an editing map, where I'm saying on a one to 10 scale, what degree of editing do you want? Okay. And say they say a six. Then I ask them, what does that six entail? You know, is that every um and um? Is that long pauses? Is that technical glitches? And let them tell me what it is they're wanting to get rid of. Because most people who've been podcasting for any length of time, know the kinds of things they want removed. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of define for that client, okay, this number six level includes these kinds of things. But beyond that, I have two things in my background that have helped me with this particular business. One is that I have that role as a pastor for so many years. So I know what good public communication sounds like. I know what good pauses sound like. I know what good expression sounds like. And so I train my editors to listen for those things and to respect those things. Just because there's a long silence here between timestamp 065 and and 085 doesn't mean you have to cut all of it out. Sometimes spacing is a good thing. So we talk about that as a team. And I try to get my editors to understand what good pacing sounds like. But then at the same time, I try to help them understand what does good comprehension depend on? And that is good communication by the speaker. So if a person is stuttering and stammering and restating themselves seven times before they actually say what they're trying to say, I try to just teach them to listen for that and say, okay, he started here and he ended here. And at the end is what he really wanted to say. So a lot of this in the middle can be trimmed out. And the majority of my clients really appreciate that because it gives them a really succinct, punchy show that gets to the point and at the same time is enjoyable to listen to for the listener. I mean, you're totally right that it's subjective, but I try to take a lot of the subjectivity out of it by the way I train my editors. Okay, so there's some training that goes into it. So you started with hiring your son, and then where did you find uh, the rest of your team? Well, I've got two other editors, and I've got four show notes writers besides myself, and I do some editing and some show notes writing as well. The other editors I found in Facebook groups, and one of the guys actually I found here locally where I live in the mountains of Colorado Uh, He lives here in my hometown, believe it or not, and he does audio editing for other people for a living. And and he responded to one of my Facebook group posts and said, hey, I live right where 
where you live. How can we connect? And so we, we met over coffee and I learned what he was capable of and added him to the team. And I add them all with a trial basis. You know, I'm going to give you one episode to do. I'm going to tell you what I need done and I'm going to assess how you do. And everybody is good with that. They all understand. And then another one of my editors uh, actually approached me. He sent me an email, had found my website and said, hey, I'm an audio editor. I've been doing this for this many years. I live in Canada. I would love to be a part of your team if you have room for jobs here and there. And, And little did he know I was looking for an editor right at that same time. And so because his email was like the emails I send out, it was very personal. It was very targeted. It was very short, respected my time. I replied to him right away and I said, hey, Mike, let, let's do a trial episode because you sound like my kind of guy. And sure enough, he's one of my best editors. He's, he's a great guy and he, he loves working this kind of a job where he can stay at his location he loves and work at a distance. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, the show notes writers were kind of the same thing over Facebook posts and Craigslist ads and things like that. And, and I have a, a hiring process that I've set up that requires them to jump through three or four or five hoops before they even talk to me. And the reason for that is if they can't follow directions in an application process, then they've eliminated themselves already. I don't want them because they have to be able to follow directions because we post to Libsyn accounts. We post to websites. We post using passwords. They have to be people I can trust to do what they need to do. I wrote out my like podcast SOPs finally, like my standard operating procedures. It was like a 30 30- checkpoint list. Like there's a lot of stuff that goes into every episode. It really is. And so I, I make sure that my hiring process weeds out the people who can't do that. And then the ones that are left, we have a conversation and see if there's a good fit and the writers will do a trial process as well. So you get client number one within a week. At what point did this become a a full-time business for you or is it? And in combination with the pass the safe exam, (laughs) what's, what's next? Well, that first client to what I would consider my schedule being fulfilled was probably within a year. And then within two and a half years, which is where we're at now, I have eight team members. I have myself kind of managing everything. My oldest son, who I mentioned, who was doing a lot of my editing, is now come on full time. And he's going to be more in a managerial role here shortly and be helping to both market and manage the team so that we can grow this even bigger. So my desire is to build this large enough that it fully supports he and I and enables us both to have the excess income to be generous. We both have causes that we care about that we really want to get behind and support. And this business is going to be a vehicle to do that. Are you coming to podcast movement this summer? You know, I was just thinking about that this week. I haven't bought a ticket, but I'm I'm thinking I need to be there. So I need to talk to my wife about that. <laughs> That's going to be a thousand of your target customers right there. Yeah, exactly. And I was thinking initially, you know, I've, I've got plenty of potential clients on the hook and I'm not sure I need to go for that reason. But But the more that I think about it, the more I think I just need to be there. I just need to meet people and let people know who I am and and make relationships, build relationships. Yeah, it sounds like that is a common theme between both the the study guide business and this. It's like people are developing a relationship with you and say, okay, I mean, that's how that's how it started. It started as a conversation. I think you emailed me about something completely unrelated. And then, you know, later on in that chain was like, by the way, I do podcast editing as one of my side hustles and like. Oh, you know, and it came just at the right time, you know, as our son was about to be born. I was like, I cannot spending all this time doing it and um, being a good match. Yeah, yeah, it really did. And I've, I know the team has enjoyed working with you, too. So it's that kind of thing we're looking for, a win-win thing where we are benefiting the podcaster and, and they're benefiting us, obviously, through the, the monthly pay. So, Well, cool, Carrie. Are you trying to sell any like online uh, business training or just a podcast fast track if people want to uh, connect with you? You know, I'm working right now on a new thing. It's going to be niched into a Christian business audience just because I'm a Christian. And I know there's a lot of people out there in churches who need extra income and all that kind of stuff. So I'm working on something. It's going to be at livebuildchange.com. The website is up, but it's not finished. So you can go there and kind of look at what's going on. But it it doesn't represent the final product, that's for sure. Livebuildchange.com? Yeah, exactly. Cool. LiveBuildChange.com and PodcastFastTrack.com. We'll link those uh, both up in the show notes over at SideHustleNation.com. And Carrie, let's wrap this thing up with your number one tip for Side Hustle Nation. Well, my number one tip is to not believe the lie you will hear in your own head that you can't do this. Your gifting and your experience may be totally different than mine, but the more you give in to that negative voice that tells you you can't do it, the longer it's going to be before you see any kind of change in your finances because of a side hustle. So my advice is start with something small. Maybe it's AdSense. Maybe it's a niche side. Who knows? But start somewhere. 
get started, get your feet wet, and you will learn over time that it's all in the numbers. And the more you do it and the more you learn and the more you apply what you're learning, you are going to discover that it's possible. I love it. Yeah. And, and the home run out of the gate is uh, unlikely. And I know I'm mixing metaphors there, but um, it's a process. And, I, and I'm grateful for you sharing how you have started and how the business has evolved over, over the time. Thanks, Gary. We'll catch up with you soon. Okay, Nick. Thanks. This edition of The Side Hustle Show is brought to you by FreshBooks.com. If you want to start a service business like Carrie and invoice clients like a boss, FreshBooks has your back. Here's my friend and freelance writer extraordinaire Miranda Marquit from PlantingMoneySeeds.com on why she relies on FreshBooks. This is Miranda Marquit from PlantingMoneySeeds.com and Adulting.tv. I use FreshBooks and I have been using FreshBooks for several years now. And I love FreshBooks because it gives me the chance to quickly and easily invoice clients and get paid. There are so many great features on FreshBooks from recurring invoices to templates to the fact that I can easily log in and see my dashboard and see who has paid and who needs a reminder to pay me. So FreshBooks is a great way to get paid. Uh, The fees are pretty low and... If you choose the the check e-check option, you can also get a discount on your PayPal fees. Visit freshbooks.com slash side hustle to start your 30-day free trial today. That's freshbooks.com slash side hustle. So my biggest takeaways from this episode, man, there were, there were quite a few. Number one, YouTube as a marketing or, or discovery channel. So I'm looking at Kerry's channel right now. He's got less than 200 subscribers, but he's still getting highly targeted visitors looking for help with exactly what he can help with. So I think that's a powerful strategy. On the podcast Fast Track side, someone reached out to him. Hey, what are people asking you for help with? What do people already see you as an expert in? Kind of goes back to the piggyback principle the podcasting thing does. And and what I mean by that is um, it's a trend that's going on in the popularity in podcasting. A rising tide lifts all boats. So I think that was a good market to go into. And uh, takeaway number three, or we have to four now, if you want uh, ongoing revenue, solve an ongoing problem, uh, such as podcast editing. The show is not going to go away anytime soon. And number five, the most important thing um, is relationships. Behind behind Carrie's cold email strategy, his cold email hustle, I'm in uh, a handful of Facebook groups for podcasters, and I see Carrie in there, in the conversations, helping people out with their technical questions, their editing questions, providing value. And from a personal experience, like letting go of the interview editing was really hard for me. It's such um, it's such a subjective thing. Like how do you how do you write an SOP for it for it, you know? And on top of that, the the show has become such an important part of of my brand and my week, and it's it's like my baby. It's like my art. Um, and so without that relationship, without someone having listened to the show, I can I can only imagine it's uh, it's a non-starter for most hosts without that relationship. So that uh, that email outreach is probably just the first step in in starting that conversation. So notes and links for this one are at sidehustlenation.com slash carry c-a-r-e-y and while you're there be sure to grab the free pdf highlight reel with all of his top tips from this conversation that's it for me that's all i got thank you so much for listening until next time you know what to do let's go out there and make something happen and i'll catch you in the next edition of the side hustle show hustle on Thanks for listening to the Side Hustle Show at www.sidehustlenation.com. 